The world's art is the ammo. Your screen is the weapon. And you are in our sights. Our next guest is an actor, comedian, writer, producer, and director. Throughout his acting career, he worked and shared the screen with such talents as Michael J. Fox, Michael Gross, John Astin, Meredith Baxter, McLean Stevenson, Yvonne Wilder, Julie Carmen, Gene Simmons, Ozzy Osbourne, and be directed by John DeBello of the cult classic Killer Tomatoes films on the installation known as Killer Tomatoes Eat France. But you guys, y'all know him from Trick or Treat. Come on. Trick or treat? No one? Yeah. All right. Cool. If that isn't enough, he would perform for 15 consecutive years at Harrah's in Las Vegas and produce for such cable networks as Disney Channel, Showtime, Animal Planet, Food Network, GSN, as well as TBS's Midnight Money Madness. Please welcome to the seat, the stage, Mark Price, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, Here right. we go. Let's see. We on? Um, all right, so while that is booting up, if you've got questions, Thank as you. a, there we are. Yeah, and I guess as you guys have questions, as I'm rambling, come on up to the stage, and once I slow down, you guys can swoop in and ask the real questions. But right now, I'm going to warm it up for them, and uh, you as well. So um, like something that's an often occurring theme that I'm always going to ask everybody is talking a little bit about your life before show business stepped into the picture for you. You're like a real life Wayne and Garth. Yeah. <laughs> you're, a, you're very good at this, okay, actually. Good, I got to say. Ooh, all right. <laughs> no, because I've done a lot of interviews and you've got a great energy. Okay, awesome. That's exactly, I make it a point just to <laughs> be in To do, do a lot of drugs before you do these things. Yes. We're just <laughs> pacing around me like, believe in myself. So talk a little bit about like, um, your life before this whole acting producing. I started so young that I didn't have much of a life before. Uh, I was a kid. I was a little kid. I grew up in Hollywood in the 80s in showbiz. Michael Jackson never touched me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was very lucky because um, my dad was a comedian. He was an old-time comedian. And my dad was on the radio with Fred Allen, and he was on the Ed Sullivan Show. Wow. And he worked with people like George Burns and Dang. greats from the old, old days. And he took me to see those guys. So I actually got to hang out with George Burns and okay, so Milton Berle and people like that when I was a little kid. I, you, where do we begin? Share some stories of how they were for you. Well, it was pretty incredible because I wouldn't just meet them. I would get to hang out. Like I brought Milton Berle his tea before he'd go on. And Dude. I would, uh, I remember I, said, I pitched a joke to him and that was a big deal. Or, or we'd ride back in the limousine to New York City from upstate New York in the Catskill Mountains with Joey Bishop or somebody like that Holy and talk crap. about jokes and shows and stuff. It was a great introduction to comedy. But my dad had been around for so long that he took me to go see the younger comedians, which in those days were Robert Klein and uh, David Brenner. Yeah. You know, um, now they're the old guard. But in right. those days, they were the kids. And he, he, he always kind of kept me moving on the track of uh, forward thinking and modern comedy and all that. That is so cool. So that knocks out one of the questions on this list as far as comedy has always been a part of your life. Always been a part of my life. I moved out to Hollywood when I was 13, uh, really more like when I was 11, actually. Uh, uh, 11 to 13, I kind of moved out west and mm -hmm. um, got into Hollywood showbiz. I'd already been in comedy, Man. but that's when I started auditioning and acting and that kind of thing. And then I guess that must have been a huge splash, like um, th as far as like everything being connected and like things being easy to access. I went on TV as a comedian on the Merv Griffin show when I was 13 years old. Wow. And they called me into NBC and sort of found family ties for me after that. Dang. So it started as a stand-up, and then I started acting, and I did a couple of movies, and um, one of them it was my first movie that I ever made. I was 15 years old. And that one, no one's ever seen. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Which one is it? It's, there might be someone that yells. It's yeah. called The Zoo Gang. Zoo and it, Gang. It had a, an alternative title. It came out again called Winners Take All. And um, I was away on location making this movie, and Family Ties called me to be in an episode. And they were like, what? He's Skippy's not available? He's working on a movie? And that's how I got the contract to be on regularly. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So I guess um, from a workflow standpoint, from an acting standpoint, and just from a delivery standpoint, is there incredible differences in television and in film? 
or which do you prefer? Well, you know, all these answers go date back some time. Uh, these days, I don't even know the difference anymore, what's going on in showbiz. But uh, in those days, yeah, it's a, there's a difference. The whole setup of how it works, the process, um, yeah. you know, it's different. It's uh, fun. Yeah. Both of them are fun. You're more like a team effort when you're working on a movie. I mean, the TV show was a team effort, too, but it's just different. People come in. It's more like a nine-to-five. You live where you shoot. When you go on location to make a movie, it all changes. It's camp. It's summer camp. The crew, the actors, you're all in Vietnam together. Oh, my God. You know, making <laughs> this movie. Yeah. And then, um, I guess... And if the movie happens to be Platoon, all the more like Vietnam. But right. even if it's just trick-or-treat. <laughs> Which, um, speaking of different genres of film, I, I don't believe you've done another horror film prior to Trick or Treat. That must have been your Yes, first. Trick or Treat was my first. My first. Was it your best? No doubt. Uh, yeah. Directed by Charles Martin Smith, who movie fans remember from uh, American Graffiti. He played Toad. I failed from my research standpoint. That's awesome. And no he'd idea. been in a lot of movies, too. The Untouchables and Starman. He's been in a lot of stuff. And he went on to direct the Air Bud movies. What? <laughs> Get out of here. And That's... he was super yeah. cool to work with. And then um, the soundtrack, of course, uh, we, we heard rough tracks while we were making the movie. And everybody knew that was going to be what was going to make this thing fly was the music. Sound fast way. Dude. So I guess receiving direction from Charles <laughs> Martin Smith. Yes, like yeah, it's just I don't <laughs> need to say. It. Like, um, what, what compared to all the directors you've worked with throughout your career? He identified with me because I was kind of nerdy, and he had always played nerdy Toad. Yeah, you know? and I think he booked me to do the movie because of that, because we we had similar outlooks on things. You know, Keanu Reeves was up for the role. No kidding. And, uh, I, you know, they probably hit themselves today. We could have had Keanu Reeves. Nah, it worked out, it worked it worked out, out. very well. But, um, but Charlie probably is the reason why I got chosen. No, that, that's very cool. And um, I guess... That's I got into it. I listened yeah. to a lot of heavy metal music. I, I, there's a monologue in the beginning of the movie, and I recorded it on audio and sent it to the director, which is kind of a ballsy thing to do as an actor. Yeah. And uh, never hear, I've never I was heard anybody pretty committed to getting the role. I was determined. That is so cool. And then I guess um, working on the same stage as Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. G Gene Simmons was great. And uh, Ozzy, I feel like I knew the secret of Ozzy before everyone else did, because you saw the TV show and you got to know that Sharon runs the show and he can be a little goofy and he's not exactly the, the demon of darkness that we all perceived him to be. Right. And I kind of was in on that ahead of the game. Wow. That's, that's Great guy. Uh, and Sharon's fantastic too. So when a fan from the movie uh, contacted me and said they were too ill to go to a concert in the Detroit area <laughs> in Michigan, um, the fan asked for an autographed picture of Ozzy. So I contacted Sharon in England and left a message with the kid's address. Could you send an autographed picture? And Ozzy and Sharon showed up at his house in the limousine before the show. I still think back to how incredible that was. I can't begin to picture something like that happening to anybody. So I the know. demon of darkness is a, uh, a really good hearted person that cares about his fans. And, uh, I've always been a, you know, huge fan of his. That's amazing. And then I guess um, based on the way things are sounding, this might be different. You might have a different outlook. Like uh, what is the most important project do you feel to your career? <laughs> the most important project. All right, I guess the one that got to you the most gears rolling? Well, Family Ties probably is the biggest thing I've ever been a part of. Okay. But a few years ago, I was the spokesperson for a technology that allows people to grow anything at all with no paid for water year round, even in the desert, even during a drought, even in the dry summer months. It's an amazing technology and nobody knows about it. And that was the most important thing I ever did was actually get the word out about that. But I didn't succeed at, for instance, no one here knows about it. <laughs> so apparently I wasn't a very effective spokesperson but I thought about it, and I decided that was the most important thing I will ever be associated with because yeah. it has to do with being able to grow food when you otherwise can't. Right. <laughs> and it's an amazing thing, and I can't even believe I stumbled into that, but I did. But I'm a failed environmentalist as I was unable to uh, move that forward. But yeah. solar 
and a lot of other wonderful uh, Earth-friendly technologies uh, took a lot of time to come around. And so people have pointed out that maybe I got people that just think about it a little bit, and years later that might add up to some, some kind of effective effort in helping move it forward. Have you ever thought about... So have you ever thought about We don't know which is which. Which one? Okay. All right. We're back. Okay. So I guess um have you ever thought about being like um going back into the spokesperson world again? Uh yeah, but that was it was really hard disheartening this pointing uh, experience trying to get the word out about this amazing technology that could change lives and having no one care. But I've decided one of the reasons why no one cares is because even though you hear stories about how water is limited and will someday be wars over water and water is everything, right now it comes out of our hose and there's an endless amount of it and it doesn't cost that much and nobody really cares. And even in California with the drought, that's what I found. Farmers, every, nobody really cared to learn how to live with using less water. But it's 2017, and we care so much now. We, we can make it happen. <laughs> Supposedly. Ah, okay. So if they, I decided that if they charged for water like gasoline, and we all had meters in our house, then people would care. <laughs> I guess um, that, that saying, you don't miss your well until, or you don't miss your water until your well's gone dry, true that. And then I guess um, as far as... Like, uh, per like uh, performing in Las Vegas for 15 years, like, um, what was that experience like? Was that, like, your main focus at the time? And okay, so it wasn't like I was uh, all year round for 15 yeah, years. Okay. I'd go about four times a year, and I've been doing that actually longer than 15 years, but I don't know where you read that. You might have read okay. that 15 years ago this is why on the Internet. Research uh, <laughs> is it's been wrong. About, it's been about 30 years. Okay. I've been going to Las Vegas and Tahoe. I've right. Harris there, and I love it. <laughs> But I go all yeah. over the country. Okay. Next uh, month, we have a 15-city tour around New York State. Oh, that's really cool. And then I guess um, when the, when does – I'm sorry, when did you say that started? Next or? Uh, month, uh, for the month of October. Okay, awesome. So if any of y'all are New York-based or need to find an excuse to go to New York, y'all have got it now. And so I guess something else I wanted to really talk about is, like, um, you getting into the producing world. And, like, uh, how did that come to be? be like because that's a whole other gear shift it from is. it's uh, a little different i don't know if this one's on anymore i'll try this one uh we sh started in uh hollywood uh, right around uh 18 years old i did a i had hosted a show for the disney channel actually i think it was more like 20 21 something i forget somewhere in there so long ago who knows i was young and uh disney channel invited me to uh executive produce and uh, direct a uh a, a one-hour special and that was it i got hooked Loved the behind the scenes. Really got a chance to study the the uh, family ties behind the scenes, and I was very impressed with all the producers and all the writers and everything on that. And so I I started working for uh, Animal Planet. People don't know this, and Food Network, and TBS, and Game Show Network, and E Channel, and uh, uh, was mostly projects with comedians. And um. So I guess, yeah, it sounds like even during Family Ties, were you almost like, um, would it, during discussions, they would talk to you about, have these discussions with you, or would you step into the booth where they are? Or? Right, so I, w I didn't have that much to do on Family Ties all the time, so I took advantage of the extra time to have it be like a college for me. So I would go to the booth, like you're talking about, and I would sit under the window where the writers were having their meeting and listen in secretly, and I, I really did study the great people that we had on our, our staff. No, no, no. It's um, it's all right. And then uh, I guess my rambling is going to slow down just a little bit. So if anybody's got questions, questions, yes. Hello, I'm Angela, and I'm interested in writing horror films. And <laughs> and I was wondering, how does one go forward? A, a common person that has a desire, interest go forward in trying to get a, a written screenplay out. What, what did you say your name was? Angela. Angela. It's good answer for you. There's a good answer. So 
in Hollywood, it's very hard to get anything made, anything made. But a TV series on a network, near impossible, because they only deal with the people that have successful shows on the air. And how do you get one if you don't have one? You're number two for 20 years. But when it comes to movies, really, anybody that writes a movie script has got a chance. If you get it out there and it's a good script, um, it is possible to be a complete unknown, never have done anything before, write a movie script and get it made. Still hard to do, but possible. It's doable. Uh, because that's they don't require that you have had done anything prior to doing it. Um, it's really just about, th is, does somebody like the script? Does yes. somebody want to see it get made? And I would go so far as to say, add to that, it's not the grades you make, but the hands you shake. And um, that's definitely been my motto. <laughs> for there you go. Uh, so uh, how do you do it, though? You write the script, you make sure it's a really good script, and then you get it to the right people, people that would make sense to produce it. You s research similar movies and who was involved and who the key people were and uh, contact those people. And you won't find a lot of resistance. You'd be amazed. It's not like everybody's going to be like, oh, I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. I don't need you. If you say the right things and tell people, hey, I got this great script and maybe here's the log line and it's cool and it sounds good, people will be like, yeah, send it over. But, you know, there are offices, they've got people that do nothing but read scripts all day and they, they grade them and stuff and they take the best ones and send them up the ladder. Sweet. Anybody else? All right. Hey, man, Adan. Uh, so if you weren't doing comedian and you weren't in movies, what do you think you'd be doing? What's your other passion? That's a good question. Uh, what other skill sets do I have? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I would do. It's always been such a part of my life. It's scary to think about it. Uh, I, I mean, with a producing background, you'd have a foot in the door with marketing and with business. Marketing and stuff, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's such a weird question because I've done it my whole life. I'll tell you that I book myself now a lot of my own agency, and I'm working on a lot of different tours with a lot of people. One's called The Legends of Sitcom, and it features people from, you know, everything from Night Court to King of Queens and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I produce that. I, I don't know. It's still showbiz, though, you know. But if it wasn't in front of the cameras or in front of the mic or whatever, behind the mic, I would probably be uh, agenting and producing, which I do already anyway, just to keep me working. And then I guess I'm going to try to leapfrog off that question for a little bit, mentioning that you have your own agency. And then I guess, um, how did that come to be? What struck that t for you? Just yeah. on the road, it's uh, very difficult to, uh, like... Um, like life itself in the United States these days, in show business, the middle class has been removed. And you're either making nothing and struggling along, or you're making $20 million a picture. And so that goes for comedy, too. You're either Chris Rock, and you're selling out Madison Square Garden, or you're struggling to get that show going at the bar or whatever, wherever you're playing. And so um, it's just the, the and there's a million comedians now. And so the just... The industry changed, and it just demands. There, there just isn't enough agents that make enough money to bother. You just have to do it yourself. Yes. Cool. It's a good rule. If you want something done right, do it yourself. I like it a lot more anyway because now I don't just go wherever they offer me to go. I go to Florida in January, and yeah. I come here for this festival, <laughs> and I'm going next month in beautiful uh, October where the leaves turn in gorgeous colors in upstate New York. And so I get to decide where I want to go, and I like that better. That's and who awesome. I want to go with. That, that's the most important part, because sometimes you don't have a choice. Have you ever been in such a case? Did, should we mention that your last guest up here, Angela Jones, from the movie Pulp Fiction, is the love of my life. And y'all are right next door to each other. I have to mention that, because that's by far my best credit. <laughs> oh, come on. All right. That's – all right. Anybody else? Questions? 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 Uh, how did you pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. Not sure. All right. So if you're cool with that, I feel like um, we're going to wrap it here pretty soon. And um, Thank you, Hunter. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody at the Cult Classic. I want to say thank you to the people who put this on, to Roy and Teresa and to Ed and to the staff and the crew here for being some of the nicest people I have ever met. And I've met a lot of nice people. Hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. <laughs> have a good day, everybody. From all of us at PBS, remember, weaponize your art and use your weapon responsibly.